let's continue the discussion of the impact of uh, uncertainty and from a climate policy. I'm going to talk about this one here. In 2009, Marty Weitzman, who you see displayed here, uh, published a paper in which he argued that the uncertainty about climate change may be too large for expected utility maximization. Basically, the paper says everything that Nordhaus and uh, all those other people have done with their um, fancy models doing um, integrated assessment and trying to calculate the optimal uh, climate policy, all that work is wrong because the uncertainty is simply too large to do it. Uh, and the core of the argument is that if the growth rate of net consumption is uncertain, and of course it is, uh, and we do not know the standard deviation of the growth rate, and the growth rate is normally distributed, um, then the net present welfare goes to minus infinity, and it's first price of derivative, the social cost of carbon is unbounded. Uh, and the reason for this is that the chance of a disaster, the chance that something really bad happens, of course, falls as you look at ever more disastrous disasters. Uh, but that decrease is polynomial, uh, while uh, the chance increases, decreases polynomially, uh, while the impact how bad things get, increase exponentially. So that is this curve again. If there is an, inc an exponential increase in the impact, even though the probability of this happening uh, decreases uh, quite steadily as well. But not exponentially, uh, polynomial. And as a result, your expectation doesn't exist. The uh, integral that calculates the expectation is unbounded. Now, the technical details uh, of Weizmann are tough, hard to understand. Um, there's two alternative derivations. Uh, and the first is, let's go back to the Ramsey rule. The Ramsey rule says that the consumption discount rate R is the pure rate of time preference plus uh, the curvature of the utility function and the growth rate of consumption. Uh, we talked at length about rho and what it should be. I did not talk much about G, um, but if G goes negative, then there is a chance that your consumption discount rate also goes negative. Now, particularly if G is smaller than minus rho over eta, then your discount rate becomes negative, and that means that the further out in time you go, the more weight you place on that particular uh, outcome on that particular year. Conventional discounting is positive, and that means that the further you look into the future, the less you care. But if your discount rate is negative, then the further out you look into the future, the more you care. So if there is a chance that the impact of climate change is so large that the economy shrinks, then the Ramsey discount rate goes negative. That means that your net present uh, welfare loss just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing, um, and the whole thing just uh, explodes because there is a very long future uh, out there. And the only thing that you need for this really is that there is a chance that the impact of climate change is so large to wreck the economy. And that chance can be. Uh, very, very small, it just needs to be greater than zero. There is a third derivation of the Dismal Theorem uh, that uh, I'm going to... There's a third derivation of the Dismal Theorem that is essentially a variant or rather the dual of the St. Petersburg Paradox. The St. Petersburg Paradox, uh, recall, is due to Daniel Bernoulli, who you see here. So how does it work again? You're going to toss a fair coin. Uh, the game ends if tails, uh, uh, but if heads, then the stake doubles. The initial stake is two pounds. Uh, the expected payoff of this game is, well, um, chance of one half of um, throwing a head uh, to win two, then you play again, the chance of a quarter to win four, the chance of one eight to win eight, and so on and so forth. The probability goes rapidly to zero, uh, but the, um, the payoff rapidly goes up as well, 
So really this is a sum of 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. So the payoff of this is infinitely high. It's, um, and that essentially means that the payoff of this particular lottery is very, very big. So you should be willing to pay everything you own to enter this bet. You should be willing to bet the house in order to play this game. Of course you're not. It's a ridiculous thing uh, to do. Um, and the solution here uh, is of course that once we introduce risk aversion, uh, you get a finite uh, payoff and you would not bet the house on this game. Um, so this is what uh, Benoui did back in the 18th century. Uh, Moving forward to the 21st century, Susama uh, Kato um, did suggest the following uh, game. There is a 50% chance of losing 50% of everything you own. There's a 25% chance of losing 75%, 12.5% chance of losing 87.5%, and so on and so forth. The 2 minus k chance of losing 1 minus 2 minus k to the power 2 minus k of everything you own. The expected loss of this <coughs> is 50 over 50, so that's 1 over 2 times 2, and 25% that's a quarter over losing 75, so that's 1 over 2 to the power 4, 1 over 2 to the power 6, and so on and so forth. And when you work out uh, this particular series, you would find that your expected loss is one third, one third of everything you own. And that means that you would be willing to pay a third of everything you have to avoid uh, entering into this particular bet. That seems a bit meager because <laughs> a, you're rapidly, rapidly, rapidly losing everything you own. So if again we introduce um, risk aversion, and we just set uh, the risk of rate of risk aversion uh, to um, Q2 in this case, then your expected utility, utils, are right, here being measured in uh, dollars, is one half times minus two, one quarter times minus four, one eight times minus eight, that's minus one plus minus one plus minus one plus minus one, that's minus infinity. So you would be willing to pay everything you have to avoid uh, to avoid this entering into this particular bet, uh, and that is essentially what the decimal theorem does. Uh, there is a chance of losing everything, and that means that you're willing <laughs> to pay quite a bit to avoid uh, that particular scenario. Uh, and the decimal theorem is essentially just the dual of the St. Petersburg paradox. Now, regardless of which of the derivations you follow, uh, the decimal theorem says that expected net present alpha is unbounded, and therefore the PQ tax is arbitrarily large. Now, there's been many interpretations of what uh, Weizmann really said. Some see the decimal theorem as a formalization of precautionary principle, others as a justification of arbitrarily stringent climate policy. That is not true. The decimal theorem only says that you cannot use cost benefit analysis in certain circumstances if the uncertainty is too large. Um, and in that paper or in follow up papers, Weizmann does not indicate what to do uh, instead. But the idea that this would justify an arbitrarily large uh, carbon tax, that it would justify an arbitrarily large, uh, arbitrar arbitrarily stringent climate policy, that cannot follow. Because yes, we can argue that in the long run, uh, CO2 emissions could, should go to zero, and we should stop climate change. That is a perfectly respectable argument. Um, and we can argue about how fast uh, that should happen. Uh, a lot of disagreement there, I and mean, reasonable people can have very different opinions on this. Um, but you cannot argue that we should stop using fossil fuels now, that we should stop emitting CO2 now, because in the short run, uh, CO2 or CO2 is not essential, but fossil fuels are essential, and you cannot get energy out of fossil fuels without burning, uh, without emitting CO2. An arbitrarily large carbon tax would essentially stop everything. It would essentially mean that you can no longer, lo no longer run your uh, power generating plants, and it means that the lights will go out, 
means that you cannot charge your phone anymore and that uh, the communication towers will stop and that most people would see that as a fairly large loss. It also means that you cannot grow any food anymore because there's not, not enough food anymore because fertilizers and uh, the production of fertilizers also emit CO2. Uh, and of course agriculture is very mechanized and also farms are far away from cities so we need trucks uh, to ship the food uh, to where we live uh, and of course we need to refrigerate the food otherwise it spoils so if you're going to impose an arbitrary large carbon tax then you can't forget about food production um, and the result would be that within a month or so uh, <coughs> billions uh, of people would start uh, to starve and in three months from now uh, uh, many billions would have died uh, of starvation. <clears throat> That's actually not true. Uh, because if you cannot use fossil fuels anymore, then you can also no longer run your water treatment plants. Uh, and that means that you would be drinking dirty water pretty quickly, and dirty water will kill you within weeks. Um, so an arbitrarily large carbon tax stopping fossil fuel use today cannot be the answer can stop using fossil fuels in a century or so, maybe in half a century or so, but not tomorrow. So Weissman only says that you cannot use cost-benefit analysis, and he doesn't say what you can do uh, in its place. Now, there are alternatives. There are alternatives uh, for decision, alternative decision-making criteria under a very large uncertainty. Uh, and a standard one is due to Savitz, who you see here, uh, and it's known as Minimax Regret. Uh, and this is an old criteria and has been used uh, in many cases. So what do you do in Minimax uh, Regret when applied to climate policy? Uh, so first, you pretend that there is no uncertainty. And for every possible state of the world, you find the optimal carbon tax. Then, for every tax, possible carbon tax, uh, in every state of the world, you calculate the difference between welfare, given a arbitrary tax, uh, and you calculate the welfare from that, and the deviation of the welfare from the optimum uh, tax. And this deviation you call regret. Then, you're going to reintroduce the uncertainty and across states of the world, you're going to find that tax that minimizes regret. Now, Savitz proposed this for uh, discrete probability distributions and discrete alternatives. Um, but as uh, probabilities in this particular case, climate change are continuous, you cannot calculate the maximum regret, you can only calculate uh, the percentile uh, of the regret. Um, and the result is uh, this particular graph, if we apply it to one particular model. Uh, so what is going on here? Um, in blue, no. on the horizontal axis, you're looking at a carbon tax that is imposed. Uh, and it then follows our teller that is imposed in the year 2015, and it follows our telling rule uh, into the future. Uh, on this axis, you're looking at utility. On this axis, you're looking at uh, regret. Um, so first we're going to pretend that Weizmann never wrote this paper and we're just going to calculate uh, the optimal, um, we're going to maximize expected um, welfare, or rather we're just going to draw the welfare function. Um, so uh, this is the welfare you would attain if there's no climate policy and then you're going to increase uh, the carbon tax and what you see is that welfare increases and you find an optimum here, and then welfare uh, decreases. Um, this is um, insightful in and of itself, because the utility function is actually a peculiar uh, shape here. The welfare function is actually a peculiar shape here. What you see is that for a little bit of climate policy, welfare rapidly increases. And we use an optimum, but then welfare only very gradually declines. It means that if you accidentally, or if you make a mistake with your carbon tax, if it's too high or too low, actually it better be too high. Uh, because 
having a carbon tax that is too high doesn't hurt that much but having a carbon tax that is too low actually hurts quite a bit uh, so you're not quite sure where to put it err on the conservative side to work too hard <coughs> So that is the um, welfare maximization, and then the red and the green lines are um, regret minimization. Um, and as I said, you cannot have maximum regret, because uh, that's simply not defined, but you can have median regrets, or the 75 percentile of regrets, or the 90 percentile, or the 95, or the 99, or the 99.5. You cannot quite get to the 99.9 .9 because then you know, as you see this curve actually uh, becomes non-smooth and it's not being estimated with great confidence and it's just a matter of not having enough runs in the Monte Carlo analysis. Um, but what do you see when you focus on uh, the regret curves? Uh, first they re decline rapidly. That is a little bit of climate policy avoids a lot of regret, does a lot of good, uh, essentially. Uh, then there is some sort of optimum or a minimum in regret, and then regret starts easing up very gradually. So essentially, this shape is the same as this shape here, right? If you're going to err on your climate policy, then you better err on imposing too high a carbon tax. Um, the intriguing thing here is that all these uh, green and red curves have a minimum that lies somewhere between 100 and 170. And the maximum uh, expected welfare has an optimum that lies somewhere between 100 and 170. So the argument here is that, yeah, so Weitman says well, Nordhaus says you should do this, you should find the maximum of this curve. Weitman says you're crazy, you can't do that, you should instead do something else. And then Savage says, well, in that case, you should minimize the points uh, of this curve, you should minimize uh, this particular curve. The result isn't actually that different. The recommended carbon tax is roughly uh, the same. The problem uh, with minimum uh, regret is that it actually does not necessarily lead to a satisfactory outcome. Essentially, what you do, you're, you do your best in each state of the world, uh, but you can't do more than your best, uh, and then you make sure that you're robust to uncertainty. Uh, but there's no guarantee that the outcome will be acceptable. Regret may be small because it's a small difference between two very low levels of welfare. Uh, regret is essentially a measure of the slope of the welfare function rather than its level. Uh, so you can also directly attack uh, the tail. And this is work done by David Antle. Um, so, first question is how do you actually detect that you have a problem? A problem, uh, as Weizmann suggests, namely that the expectation of welfare doesn't exist. How would you actually know that? Because we can write down the equations and say, well, this uh, particular integral doesn't convert, and that's essentially what Weizmann does. Um, but if you have a model and you run it one time, then you have a result. And if you run the model a thousand times with slightly different parameters in the so-called Monte Carlo analysis, and then you take the average welfare across these models, then your uh, expectation exists by definition. Expectations are finite in a finite sample by definition. So one way of uh, discovering that something is wrong is to look at this particular curve. Um, so in the red curve you're looking at the expected welfare if there's no climate policy, uh, so zero carbon tax. Um, as a function of the number of observations, rather the number of runs in the Monte Carlo uh, study. And if you have a, a thousand runs, then this is your expected welfare, and if you have two thousand runs, then this is your expected welfare. Now, the law of large numbers will tell you that this curve should convert to the true expectation. But it doesn't. 
uh, it jumps and it jumps and it jumps. So here you have 4,000 observations already, or almost 4,000 observations. You have one additional observation. Boom, your number changes. Same here. You have uh, more than 5,000 observations, and still you haven't uh, estimated your expectation with any sort of certainty. Uh, because it still can jump just because of one additional observation. And here there is shift, and here it jumps up again, and then it jumps down again, and so on and so forth. What you would expect is that if you increase the number of observations, then this curve should flatline. It doesn't. Um, and how do we know it doesn't flatline? Well, we can uh, close our eyes here and say, well, let's pretend that this is time. And this is our observation, and if we pretend that this is time, then we say, hmm, this uh, particular time series looks non-stationary to me. Of course, we have perfect tests, or well, we have good tests for non-stationarity. A few things are perfect. Um, so that is what is going on uh, in this particular graph, where apply the augmented uh, dickey fuller test. Uh, sensing the probability of observing the data under the null hypothesis of non-stationarity, uh, that is, uh, the same is fat. Um, and uh, on this axis, we now have the p-value, the confidence with which we reject the null hypothesis, and on this axis, on the horizontal axis, we still have uh, the carbon test. The pattern is again the same thing. So a little bit of a carbon tax increases our rejection of the null hypothesis, essentially makes the curve, uh, makes the time, time series uh, stationary. But then a carbon text that is too large, we actually start patterning the tail again, and we actually have less confidence uh, in uh, the rejection of our null hypothesis. And again, there is an optimum and again, that optimum lies very close to uh, the earlier criteria that I showed. So essentially, uh, the pattern that we see here is that no climate change is bad. There is a real probability of things going disastrously wrong. A little bit of uh, climate policy rapidly takes away the pain of climate change. But then if we impose too high a carbon tax, we start hurting the economy again because we work too hard. We go move too fast away from fossil fuels and causing lots uh, of economic pain in that way. So uh, on this side uh, of the minimum in this case, uh, the uh, disease is worse than the cure. If we go beyond the optimum, if we push the carbon tax too high, and the cure is worse than the disease. And again, you see that there's an asymmetry there, that if you have a carbon tax that is too high, a little bit too high, that is not nearly as bad as a carbon tax that is a little bit uh, too low. Uh, 